Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the first session of Erwin Mitchell's Let's Talk About Stroke mini series. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and for taking the time out of your busy schedules to connect with us. I'd also like to thank our fantastic guest speakers for agreeing to take part in what we hope will be a really informative and helpful session. My name is Jenna Harris and I'm a senior associate solicitor at Erwin Mitchell specialising in medical negligence claims and I'm co-hosting today um, with my colleague Gurpreet Lally from our Cambridge office. Both Gurpreet and I have a special interest in stroke cases so we're really excited about today's session and the rest of the series. Um, just by way of reminder today's webinar will focus on stroke rehabilitation our second session, which will take place at the same time next Thursday, will be focusing on neuropsychology and capacity for stroke survivors. And the final session will focus on working with stroke survivors, and that will be taking place on Thursday, the 28th of January, again at the same time in the afternoon. If you haven't already signed up for the other sessions, please feel free to do so. And we've got some excellent um, speakers lined up for you. Before I hand over to Gurpreet to introduce our fantastic guest speakers, I just wanted to run through a couple of housekeeping points, if that's OK. Um, firstly, thanks to those who have already submitted questions. We'll do our best to ensure that they're addressed towards the end of the session today. If you haven't already submitted a question and you'd like to do so throughout, um, please use the live Q&A function that's on your screen and we'll try to, our best to answer them all at the end of the session. Um, when you're submitting your questions, we just ask that you include your name and address. So if we don't get round to any, we can make sure that we can respond to you directly after the event. We will also be recording this event, so that will be circulated afterwards. And if you have any queries, um, once you've had a look at the recording, please do not hesitate to get in contact. Um, finally, towards the end of the session, we'll be posting a feedback link for today's event and we'd ask that you kindly just take two minutes to let us know what you thought about the session and provide us with your feedback. Thanks again, everybody. I'll now pass over to Gurpreet. Thank you, Jenna. Um, so to start today, our first speaker is Emma Richards, who is a neurophysiotherapist. Um, in 2008, Emma set up Sheffield Neurophysio because she wanted to create an equality uh, physio service that would enable clients to meet their inspirational goals. Her interests are treating people with complex neurological presentations and optimising their rehabilitation potential through holistic client-centred interventions. Alongside her clinical work, she's also a senior lecturer at Sheffield Hallam University and has taught uh, internationally in Egypt and Qatar. Um, Emma also acts as a medico-legal expert um, in um, uh, personal injury cases. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Emma now. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. As, as GURPS has just mentioned, I've worked in with stroke patients for many, many years. And more recently, I've moved into the, the private sector and into, into the medical legal world. I have a real passion for working within rehabilitation, especially of stroke patients. I think the, it's really important for patients to achieve their ultimate goals, their, their potential. And so I'm going to talk about um, the pathway of, of rehab that neurophysiotherapies is involved with when, when we're involved in the in the MDT. So if we just move the slide on, please. So just to have a have a little reminder. When somebody has a stroke, they have damage in their brain. But as the as the person becomes more medically fit, they have start to gain some neurological recovery. The brain is a really fantastic thing. It can recover and, and it can become plastically changed. So physiotherapy in the early phase or the early recovery phase tends to be a little bit more involved in um, managing chest physiotherapy, maintaining um, joint alignment, preventing secondary complications, but then also advising the rest of the team about moving and handling. 
When we then move into later recovery, so when the patient becomes medically stable and when they start to move around a bit more, this is when physio is involved in, in trying to access neuroplasticity. So neuroplasticity is the ability of the nervous system to modify itself structurally and to functionally reorganise itself. So if you look at the pictures here, you can see there's some some nerve pathways there and as you can see collateral sprouting has occurred over a, a few weeks period and so this is what we we as physios try and do we we try and encourage the the, the body to experience efficient movement and try to help unmask maybe pathways that, ha that, that are present in the brain but maybe haven't, haven't been accessed before. There's a lot of the brain that we, we don't use that, that's latent as you call and also there's, there's quite a lot of swelling and damage which, which if we can help improve the fitness of the individual and help to um, in, improve the perfusion of the brain we can prevent further damage. So if you just press the next slide please. So the question within rehab is, what is it patients want to achieve? So what drives physiotherapy choices in clinical interventions with clients? So we've got guidance out there, such as the, the National Clinical Guidelines, which are from 2016, NICE guidelines, which are the, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence guidelines, and other guidelines such as the, the SIGN guidelines, but these are all constantly needing to be reviewed and they're usually based on excellent research or best practice, uh, um, highest quality research, which tends to be quite limited to some extent. So what I mean by that is it, um, best research needs to have some sort of randomised control trial, which limits the actual um, flexibility of the, of the amount of um, exploration into rehab you can do. So it's it's usually looking at a snapshot of, of a, a small area within, within rehab. But actually, if you explore how much evidence is, in, is, in, is implied into, into, for example, physiotherapy research. So um, in 2014, Bernhardson reviewed how much physios really um, applied the specific guidelines into clinical practice, it was found that physios could really only apply about 50% of what is said to be best practice. And I think really the question, the point I'm trying to make here is that clients' goals are not often the same as what therapy goals are, lead, lead our therapists to, so let me say that again, what patients want to achieve is not always the same as what is suggested in the guidelines to, that should lead therapy choices for, for intervention. So can you press the next slide, please? So I think what's really important is to think about what drives motor control, what drives the body to move efficiently. And what I've put on the slide here is, um, if you like, a circle of feed forwards from the brain so what comes down from the brain so descending messages from the brain providing the the body the the ability to to move so in relation to postural adjustments so how the body aligns to each other how the body reacts to to the pull of gravity and how adaptive the body is to the pull of gravity and also how the brain um, drives volitional so movements that are chosen by the individual but also how the brain stabilizes the body in an automatic fashion so how does it post how it posturally controls the body up against gravity um, as as in the messages coming feed forwards from the brain to the body but all the time this is happening, there's messages coming unconsciously and consciously through ascending pathways into the brain from vision, from the balance system in the inner ears, from um, proprioception in joints, from other receptors, from sensation. So there's a constant feedback, feed forward, adjusting all the time 
to the demands of what's happening within the alignment of the individual, what the challenges of the tasks are, and what the environment is, how the environment is feeding into the challenge. So are they on an uneven surface? Is there a lot of noise coming in? So all these feed forward feedback have demands on and, and actually give you a resultant control of movement. So if we can just move on again. So if you can just start clicking this this slide because this is so if you can see neurophysiotherapy and I've just separated it in some different areas and if you can just click it again please. So I think one of the most important areas that we need to think about is how as physios we help the person automatically balance, automatically posturally adjust. So it's about thinking about the kinetic chain or getting appropriate al alignment, thinking about appropriate joint alignment, but actually helping that person gain the, the postural stability they need to provide selective control of active movement. So not physio is not just about strengthening, not just about getting somebody out into the community and maybe building their their stamina, their fitness, their strength, or dealing with pain, their pain issues. It's about them being able to stabilize themselves to move. And that stability is on, on an automatic level on most cases. If somebody thinks about balancing, then that uses a completely different part of the body, uh, of the brain, and it takes a lot more effort than the automatic balance that you or I are using at the moment. So balance is really essential aspect of, of movement control that we need to be constantly assessing. So we need to be working out, are they overusing their vision? Is their vestibular system appropriately feeding into their brain? And are they using appropriate information from correctly aligned joints? So we need to be thinking about alignment, we need to be thinking about posture, we need to be thinking about movement and all this is about working within the team um, and the client is central to this but also alongside hands-on physio and thinking about tone, spasticity to actually work towards their goals and their gaining them gaining independence. So if we can move on to the next slide. I like this um, this um, uh, suggestion by Shumway Cook and, Cook and Woolacott. The Shumway Cook and Woolacott were a neuroscientist and a physiotherapist who worked together, mainly in rela relation to balance and understanding how balance affects how we relearn to move. So they identified three distinct areas that affect our balance the individual, so that's the client, and really how much motor activity they have, how much understanding they have, how much cognition, and how much feeling they have. So how their feedback feed forward system is working. They also talked about the importance of understanding what is the postural task that we're asking them to, to do. Are we asking them to be posturally steady in a good alignment? Are we asking them to react to a perturbation or a or a nudge or a movement or are we asking them to be able to be stable to take a step and be proactively balanced so then they talked about the importance of understanding the environment and how that influences how the person moves within their postural task so what's going on with the cognitive load. Are they being expected to carry something or use a frame while somebody's talking to them while they're getting money out of their pocket to climb on a bus? You know, what is the cognitive load of, of, of the environment? What's the surface like? Is it uneven? And what's the sensory context? Is there a lot of noise, a lot of light? So again, it's really important when we're assessing patients to be constantly reviewing all these areas to ensure that their motor relearning is as efficient as possible. So if you can move on to the next slide, please. So what does a neurological physio do in a stroke pathway? 
So if you can just move on to the next slide, please. So this is, as you can see, a, a pathway. And I'm sure if there's any clients out there or therapists out there, we, and, we, and, and, and we all know that the journey of, of stroke to stroke recovery is a winding and, and a complex pathway. And I think if you can see at the top, the, the, the cross at the top is, is their hospital journey. And that's, we're gonna move on from that to the point they're discharged home. So if then you can just start clicking the, so usually when somebody's discharged home, they're in a point where they're either transferring or maybe they're starting to walk, but physio will look at them being able to sit first to get sitting and then sitting to standing and then looking at, at walking maybe with some sort of aid. But we need to be all the time, as we've said, thinking about balance and orientation and sensation. And then we'll start thinking about them accessing the community and outside. And we'll all the time be thinking about fitness and stamina, not only of the movement muscles, but of also the postural muscles, which are the more unconscious ones. We don't think about balance as a background. So all the time we're starting to build their confidence to get on with their life. So really getting them to get out and about a bit more. So starting to reduce the reliance on therapy staff. And so building towards then gaining some more independence and reaching what their ultimate goals are. So it may be that at this point when the, we've reached their goals, we start to reduce our the reliance on physio. We'd be there for ongoing support. And as you can see in the corner, there's lots of aids and adaptations we may, may use to help somebody get to that point of their, their goals, but not their independence and starting to achieve some more, more activities in daily living without the need for so much support. So we can just move on again. So the question really, um, and I think this is um, really pertinent with, with solicitors, but also with clients, is what, what shows achievement? And I think that we have to be really wary that, that some clients like to see a measurement that they achieve, and some clients like to see something meaningful and measurable that's that's achievable and useful to them. You know, they want to be able to walk around the quadrant at home, or they want to be able to walk, climb into their bath. So we've got to be quite careful when we're making outcome measures, that it's not just a scale that is for a therapy outcome, it's actually a client-centered outcome. So we, we've got to just be aware that there are many outcomes out there, um, such as the Berg Balance Scale, which many of you will have heard of, six meter walk test, which is more of a community test, but the 10 meter walk test is more of a hospital test, functional upper limb reach test, but also the goal attainment scale, which is something that I really like because that is driven by the patient. The patient makes their own stages within that scale. I'm going to show you an example of that shortly. So I think it's really important the World Health Organization talks about um, impairment and disability and activity as different aspects of disability. So if we can just move on to the next slide. This is just a mass of words, isn't it? But this shows some of the, the scales that I, I've used in, in the past to measure either impairment, activity limitations or disability or partition barriers. There's so many different outcome measures and actually that's quite meaningful, just the, the, the rows of them, but it is about choosing the ones that are appropriate for what we need. So if we just go to the next slide, so this is just an example of a slide for one of the clients that, that, that I work with at the moment. And this client wants to be able to pick up an object with their stroke arm and take the object to the mouth. So as you can see, this, this scale goes from naught to plus two and actually to minus two. So what actually this does is give the opportunity for the, for the patient to choose a a point where they're at, which is the baseline, and actually they can go up. But if they have a bad day, it shows they're going down. And then it helps us reflect and the client reflect why they've 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 gone down and helps you actually see a progression that can go up and down. 
but actually the clients made up this goal themselves and so we've we've sat down and they've been really involved in it so we find it really helpful and really a visual goal that they can measure themselves so i think that's really in a summary what neurophysio does i think one of the things that's really important is to look at all the literature out there about the the amount of time um, rehab takes to neuroplastically change a client. So it needs to be repetitive. It needs to be meaningful. It needs to be context specific. So it needs to make sense to the client, but there needs to be enough intensity. There's a lot of work identifying intensity at the moment, and there needs to be enough intensity for neuroplastic change. So this final slide as just really points at um, a few aids and ad aids that we we use quite regularly with clients, which may be a foot up splint, maybe um, uh, a, a quite a, a user friendly um, Sabo uh, functional electrical stimulator. Um, you may use different um, gloves or different splints. We may use standing standing frames and and importantly, we often use therabikes or, or motor meds, which can be worked, you know, give activity for upper limbs and lower limbs. So I think that's that's really all I've got to say today. Um, any questions? Really happy to answer now or at the end, whatever, whichever the, um, the team are planning. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Emma. That was really interesting. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Ganesh Babishkat, who is a consultant and clinical lead um, in neuro rehabilitation medicine at the Walton Centre NHS Foundation Trust um, in Liverpool. Um, he's also the clinical lead of the uh, Cheshire and Mersey Rehabilitation Network, which provides specialist rehabilitation from hyperacute settings, acute and post-acute rehabilitation. Um, Dr. Bavikat specialises in acquired brain injuries, traumatic brain injury, prolonged disorder of consciousness, mild brain injury um, and acute uh, neuro rehabilitation. Um, as a senior clinical uh, lecturer at Liverpool um, University, Dr. Bavikat teaches in, on numerous regional, national, international meetings to raise the profile of specialist and um, rehabilitation. Um, Dr. Bavikat is also um, a medical legal expert um, and I will hand over to him now for his presentation. Thank you, Guru Preet. You can hear me? Okay. Uh, yes, and, yes. and you can see the slides okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Thank you for giving this opportunity and it's uh, my pleasure to discuss about this uh, stroke rehabilitation and the rehabilitation pathway. When it comes to treating patients following stroke or any acquired brain injury, there are always two elements to it. The element number one is the science behind it. What is rehabilitation? following stroke, brain injury, or and several other acquired brain injuries. Second thing is, what's the pathway looks like? So uh, I think the half an hour is a quite a short time to discuss both of that. I thought in the first uh, instance of this uh, meeting, I thought we'll talk about a pathway to look like what is that is available in an NHS? What is that available if, for example, if you're dealing with the patients after or one loved ones had a stroke or a patient client had a stroke and weren't expecting what is this going through, understanding about the pathway following uh, the stroke. Then there is another, another thing we usually discuss when we're te 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 teaching the clinicians or the trainees or the, and the scientific meeting is what's the science behind? What's the science behind treating and acquiring the plasticity you as emma mentioned neuroplasticity or discussed about the how to improve the brain functions or how to regain as much as possible uh, the lost functions and how to leave with disability adapting patients to the change themselves stroke can, can happen to anyone any one of us anytime anything can happen to us and no one is in you and this is a picture in front of you. There's a one person here had a stroke. Rest of them had different types of brain injury. I'm sure you best who it is on the right bottom corner there, Andrew Marr, who we all see and admire his ability as a presenter and BBC presenter, how nicely he present. And unfortunately, he gone through stroke, stroke rehabilitation, and he's back in his work. 
That is the exact rehabilitation. Rehabilitation. We are trying to take the patient back into their life, the life they led before the stroke. And that's the perfect rehabilitation we could expect is getting back to education or getting back to his own uh, employment. For example, if something happens to me today, that's what I want is get back to work as a doctor. So stroke is not uncommon condition at all. Actually, it's one of the very common conditions, whether you look into a death figure or a disability figures. A lot of patients get a stroke. More and more of us are living longer. Obviously, COVID is a different situation. Normally, pre-COVID time, this was facts are right. So we're living longer. The longer we live, the we risk with all of the things, including stroke. More than 50% of the patients following stroke leave with one who survives, leave with disability. So our science is improving. The way we deliver science is improving. That means more and more patients after stroke are, we are allowing them, or we are, we are uh, by our intensive um, uh, input, so patients are surviving. So if uh, this is why our insurance, as you may all know, our insurance for um, uh, life or death is much lower. The insurance for disability or critical insurance is much higher because the chance of death with the NHS with a good care is very low. But chance of getting into disability is extremely high because we can save lives, but we may not be able to save enough neurons just in time. It is a biggest public health crisis causing a significant problem with disability. After stroke, we are fortunate that we can live longer and we are unfortunately they live with disability. So long term planning need to be done. What is the ideal outcome? If I had a stroke or if I had one of my loved ones had a stroke, what would I like to them to or myself to return? Return to back to pre-morbid level with no or minimal disability. That's what we are all are aiming for. Or at the least discharge back to community, to the functions or even with some outpatient and community rehab. That's what we expect and we want to happen. But the reality, if you look into that, this is a long list of problems comes after the stroke. Obviously, it depends on the various factors, depends on the extent of nerve damage, depending on the extent where the lesions are, what's the pre-morbid conditions are, how soon they've gone into um, uh, access the medical care, and what are the extent of the medical care, and, and so on and so forth. Co going from the disorder of consciousness, we all know prolonged disorder of consciousness, the so-called vegetative state in the uh, his, uh, previous language, or get into where, depending on the where the where the brain damage is, can get into physical problem, behavioral problem, cognitive problem, communication problem, swallowing, visual problem. Very common after a high cardiac arrest and hypoxic ischemic brain damage, visual impairment. I'm dealing with few of them in the world now. And after effects of all this problem, that's emotional difficulties, socioeconomic problems, psychosocial elements, and all sorts of complications to come following a stroke. That includes the rest of the four lines there. So as a rehabilitation team, our aim is to reverse and the, allow the brain to regrow as much as possible and trying to get the function as much as possible and also try to see that avoiding the complications and avoiding the disability uh, developing, worsening, worsening over time. So that is a rehabilitation is about. I'm not going to read each line out of it, but it is to help patient, help family and help the society in turn by um, allowing the patient to recover. Emma has already mentioned about the ICF classification into impairment activity and participation. Obviously, as a doctor, I'll be looking for impairment, assessment of impairment and minimizing the impairment. Emma, as a physiotherapist, will be looking for activity and gaining the activity, either physical or cognitive activity to improve the participation. Then as a rehabilitation team and as a patient or as a family, all we care for is participating, participating back as our body used to do or ourself used to do before 
the injury. Then there is a confusion bit. If you read into several rehabilitation, I think you can rehabilitation such a loose terminology. You can talk from the drug rehab to alcohol rehab to physical rehab to several rehab words are there. And it is forgetting, forget about confusion to uh, lay people or uh, uh, minimally informed people, even the experts, even yourself and including clinicians practicing can get confused and dragged into where is what we are talking about. So you talk from specialist rehab centers such as mine where I work, stroke rehab center, adult rehabilitation, orthopedic rehabilitation, cognitive rehab, spinal rehab, and so on and so forth. Keep going. But this is a common pathway patient go after a normal stroke. So again, what is stroke? A sudden vascular difficulty in the part of the brain is a stroke. So it could happen due to many reasons. It could be a thrombosis, it could be embolism, it could be bleeding, that's a uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage or intracerebral hemorrhage. I'm sorry I didn't bring pictures. I usually said, uh, bring the pictures in my, to explain what I'm talking. And also it could be, technically speaking, an a cardiac arrest and hypoxic ischemic brain damage could be a stroke, but it's a diffuse stroke, diffuse brain damage. Patients after that, normally if they had a small stroke and, uh, and had a, um, uh, come there for a thrombolysis, then come to acute stroke hospitalization, have a thrombolysis and acute inpatient re rehab, then probably outpatient and home service. This is a post majority might be going through there. And this is something input they might be getting with the physician's input, rehabilitation nursing, MDT team or IDT team is an interdisciplinary team, including physiotherapy, occupational therapy, psychology, speech and language therapy, dietitian, pharmacy, and um, uh, uh, specialist nursing, and so on and so forth, and orthotics, etc. But there might be other pathway. For example, Walton is a highly specialist neuroscience center. So every small strokes may not come there, but there are uh, complicated strokes or patients with a subarachnoid patient say they get acute neurosurgical input might come in our pathway, which is a, a different pathway than the normal stroke pathway, which going to either neurology, that's interventional neurology or neurosurgery. If they need a needing a cranio, craniotomy and removal of the uh, uh, skull, and needing neurosurgical input, then they might come to the hyperacute setting. Whereas in a world center, we have a hyperacute setting, uh, such as I think there are only three such centers in the country. And the post then going to acute and post acute rehabilitation. Outcome could be varied. Outcome can be varied from a nursing home or a long term placement to a, a discharge home with some specialist care in a best case scenario. And Thankfully, our outcome is, as you can, you will be seeing very sh shortly, is much better, and a lot of our patients go home and uh, do well. And what is the name? Who am I? This is another co complex thing. You will get confused. I, you know, neuro rehabilitation, rehabilitation medicine, PMR, physiatrist. If you look into the global picture, I, I will, I travel around from the United States of America to various places into including in Asia and, uh, and all sorts of European countries. And I will be addressed in the different names and different speciality. The meanings of my speciality might change in each country where I go. So I think probably for this uh, meeting, I could you could classify me as a rehabilitation medicine or a neuro rehab specialist, but it's all other synonyms, really speaking. Wherever the patient goes, the present guidelines says that patient should be monitored by an expert who understands how the recovery process goes and the team of members, including physiotherapy, occupation therapy, speech therapy, dietitian, and so on and so forth. And at least this is the sessions we are looking for. The science behind it and the philosophy behind it, each sections are different. What we know is rehabilitation should be starting on a day one but the philosophy at each stages are different. The stage one probably in a, a very acute period, it will be stabilization time. And uh, then soon after that, you'll be looking for gaining the functions. And then the therapy again start, starts from the stretching to the um, improving the strengthening to the task specific exercises in a different methods. 
how you deliver in a patient in a normal day-to-day -day practice how you bridge your gap in the conditions such as us we are facing in a COVID time is a different uh, different talk altogether it's how what's the role of technology out there and what are the different types of technology we could be using even more than what we are doing much more than what we are doing to enhance and bridge those gaps is a different talk altogether and in, in centers such as us a page length of stay is about three months it's a long drawn process long drawn process think about ourselves we feel isolated you know, if we are uh, locked down for six weeks makes people crazy and when i come to clinic many patients told me many of them told me doctor this is new to you we were in a lockdown for three years five years seven years since my injury i mean a lockdown in a way so that is something to be borne in mind there are several conditions which can affect our brain and stroke is one of them when it comes to stroke, even though our common thinking is oh, this either infarct or bleeding, but it could be due to many, many, many reasons. Infarction could be due to thrombosis or embolism. Hemorrhagic can be due to intracerebral hemorrhage or subarachnoid or AV malformation or a venous sinus thrombosis or even hypoxic skin brain damage could be, strictly speaking, could be classified as a vascular event. Because it is a vascular event. And it is a long drawn process and made sure that the patient and the family being supported by various team members and linking together with one goal to help our patients through and through their journey normally patients coming to specialist rehab centers there are very few um, specialist rehab uh, clinicians are about 250 300 in the country and there are a few centers probably all of you know Irving Mitchell centers are I think extremely closely linked with the BSRM that's a British Society of Rehabilitation Medicine that's my society and uh, uh, so you are aware that this is one of the smaller specialities so patients go to the either stroke rehabilitation pathway or specialist rehabilitation pathway Patients sustain a large stroke, subarachnoids, or patients who had a surgical intervention, so hypoxic skin brain, brain, brain damage. Patients requiring complex such as tra tracheostomy or longer, longer in, inpatient stay requirement, they come to a specialist rehab unit such as ourselves. So I thought I'll give you a, a brief overview of what is a specialist rehab center SAR. And you can get it. Uh, those type of rehabilitation is available around the country, uh, um, but in a patchy way. When we came here, when I came here about eight, nine years ago, we knew we, this was a. Um, I'm, I'm thankful that that's a right timing. All the reorganization was going. We knew that it ha we have to work together as a team from as a seamless flow. Because I, I, I always think that what happens, what, what would I expect if I was a patient? What, what am I expecting? I'm expecting the therapist and the team and the specialist, everybody to focus on my recovery and help me to rather than hiccup and flow, seamlessly flow through the system with a little of a hiccup, waiting for funding and all sorts of things should not be my worry. My worry should be focusing on my, my recovery. And that's what we wanted to flow through as a network of from hyper acute and to the community with no hiccup and as a part working as a one unit. Now, even though there are providers are different, we wanted to work under one policy, under one network and one, one inclusion and one exclusion criteria. So that because the more policies you have, the more hiccup, more barrier you bring. And that's not going to be helpful to patients. And if you never had a chance to come to Walton Center, this is how the front uh, looks like. This is what Sid Watkins building. He's the first Formula One doctor, neuroscience state from Liverpool. Um, uh, he, uh, so the building is named after him and that's where my office said, that's what our rehab unit is based. And that's one of the few pictures of the, from the inside of rehab network and few patients. I, I, I'm so sorry that it will take you a little bit more time, but I, if it's possible, I'll try to uh, play this video just to understand the rehab. We are the 
Cheshire and Merseyside Rehabilitation Network. We support people who've experienced a traumatic illness or injury along a pathway of care. We offer a range of services across hospital and community settings which can be accessed at any point during your rehabilitation. Your pathway will be tailored to meet your needs and whatever happens you'll have an amazing team of experts on hand 24 7 to work towards getting you home and reaching your potential. Here we'll explain about how we work and the kind of support you can expect. When meeting someone new we don't see a patient we see a person. Rather than just looking at your medical needs we look at who you are. For instance who your family and close friends are and what kind of job you do your hobbies and passions, and any pet hates. Everything that makes you unique. This way, we have a much better idea of how to rebuild the whole you. Once you're onto the rehabilitation care pathway, there are lots of different possible routes, depending on your goals and needs, but the important stages are the same for everybody. First, there's admission and assessment. Then we work with you and your family to set realistic short and long term goals. We'll start with small ones first and build up to bigger ones. By communicating with you, we can fine tune them as you go along. At times it may be frustrating and difficult, but we'll be there to give you the support, encouragement and motivation you need at every stage. Because we're a network, your treating team is made up of lots of different people with different skills. All of them are specialists in rehabilitation for people who have had a traumatic illness or injury. We work together and are communicating all the time. The rehabilitation coordination team are the first people you will meet and they'll help guide you along the pathway from start to finish. You may also meet rehabilitation consultants physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech and language therapists, dietitians, psychologists, psychiatrists, nurses, vocational rehabilitation therapists, social workers, and all kinds of other health professionals and support staff. But everything we do will be tailored around you and your family's needs and wishes. Regular goal setting meetings help us make sure your rehabilitation programme is on track so we can help build the best possible future for you as fast as possible. As well as your physical and cognitive well-being, we will help you and your family with difficult emotions too by offering a safe environment for you to talk about your feelings. Our ultimate aim is to help you be as independent as possible and everything we do has our six values at the heart. Whether you're staying in a rehabilitation unit or being supported at home by our community service, your care will be second to none and when it's time to say goodbye, we'll leave you in very good hands. We'll get you there and help you build a new life using everything you can do. Hopefully you had a chance to see that and I done that. Uh, I don't want to talk about the all about the uh, how we set up and how we are here from beginning. Uh, what I wanted to say that we had this was not a, an easy journey and we had to bring together the several providers and several stakeholders where we are looking from the commissioner to the patient group we had to involve everybody to ensure that the network works closely in, in the patient's whole pathway we have seen MRS slide similar to in this line where the patient pathway as we all know the patient pathway is a long drawn and with a very complex and very windy road and we wanted to support it through and through with as much as less of a uh, worry for the patient and the family. So that's what we created the whole network. There's a Cheshire and Mercy Rehab Network where the Walton Center is the sponsoring the hub and everything else. And 
and and a lot of medical team and everything comes from Walton Center. But we are not just a Walton Center. We are wider team across the uh, Jashan and Mercy side. And uh, and we have obviously been uh, the awarded HSJ best best service redesign and the NHS England and obviously CQC outstanding rating which you probably are lot of them are aware and we have access to several other uh, partnerships in this are uh, several stroke units several spinal injury and all we work across um, several specialist rehabilitation what I mentioned before as a confusing for you we wanted to work across as a, as much joint of service as possible to under one service it was a good visual thinking for us when we started it. But the important now, I think it's the nine years down the line or 2013, we started seven, eight years down the line. So we we had a time to reflect on, see that we are we doing well. And we see, or as you can see on the left hand slide, we see patients have all sorts of brain injury, spinal cord injury, peripheral neurology and other progressive conditions. And that includes stroke. And at some point I've done a stroke specific um, the data and that was about 25% of our of our patients were stroke related. And average age is a young age, 50 is a very young age and um, very working group age group that is very productive time as well. And we have shown that the rehabilit we are, this was a target set for the type of complex patients we have to take and we have always consistently extremely high complex and patients to come to us. And uh, and their wait to come to us is very short compared to anywhere else in the country. They we have a take a, this is one year data. We pro produce this data on a yearly basis and publish it in a, on a on a public form so it can be accessible to anybody anyone really. And a huge number of patients are uh, go through our network. Uh, I think there is um, uh, there is a, a statement about say that. About 80% of them go home compared to uh, other centers as well. Uh, and the length of stay is one of the shortest to com uh, uh, compared to the like uh, other units as well. And with actual length of stay is about 70 days and compared to our what's going in predicted days uh, of the discharge as well. Uh, so yeah, we said that 81% of the patients who came to us gone home, discharged home, that's so four and five patients after the very complex end of the spectrum of rehab uh, of the acquired brain injury or spinal cord injury. And one those patients who even not gone home, they've not all gone to residential care. It's only 10% of them and the rest of them have either uh, gone to other specialist rehab because we don't provide uh, some long term rehabilitation center or sometimes in uh, due to the medical state uh, condition, they might need to go to other acute hospital site. Uh, so I think we been, uh, we also looked into not only the patient outcome and the family feedback, we also uh, co consistently take the staff feedback. It's because we all understand that the staff, healthy and supportive staff is the better outcome for the patients too. So staff well-being, patient well-being, the families have been supported, all, all, all are key pillars of this rehab, to success of any rehabilitation pathway, especially when the size of a uh, big size like that. Uh, so we have been consistently shown that we deliver that. So this was a snapshot of an inpatient care. So it's about 104 beds in total across the Cheshire and Mercy rehab, uh, Rehabilitation Network. We also run a several outpatient specialist clinic, you know, whether you start from head injury side or spasticity or a specialist rehabilitation or different clinics we run and we produce, we participate in several research and, and publish um, outcomes and the, and the various ways of improving the care by non-traditional methods too. Um, uh, uh, that includes technology. We lead on a several other projects at the moment, obviously, to see whether there any technologies can bridge the gap which has been created by the COVID and other um, associated um, uh, conditions we are in and staffing issues and all other issues we are going through, as you can understand. And there are several papers and published uh, uh, outcomes we have, uh, as you can see here in front of you, and also 
Um, uh, there are several publications out there which I'm happy to share if there's any one of you is interested in any particular part of it. And we are actively participating in research and even now we are, we are doing a lot of um, uh, work on this. One of my projects which is ongoing in, the, in, the, in, in this COVID time as well about the virtual rehabilitation. We are doing a project called as Vera, that's a virtual engagement rehabilitation assistant and to see how the technology can be bridge those gap. I think the rehabilitation, this is not the done deal. Rehab, uh, the science is improving. Our focus will be to improve the patient care and move with the science improvement over time. And we will be improving as well. There are two types of major, I think if I need to boil down and keep it simple, how I see the future, there are two ways. One thing is about the science, scientific improvement. Then you look into, can you minimize the number of nerves damage, damage to the brain or nerve cells? Can you minimize the number of damage? Can by early intervention and a very focused intervention, can you reduce that? Second point is, can you try to regrow, regenerate? That's a big if and how and uh, thing. Then you look into how to compensate and how to um, uh, how to make sure that the patient is able to gain function in spite of lost neurons. That's uh, um, uh, so as I mentioned, first thing is how to prevent the damage. Second thing is improving the nerve growth. Then looking into different rehabilitation technique, whether you're looking for transmagnetic stimulator uh, or a transcranial direct stimulation of the electricity, which has been, I think, heavily used in the European continent or the, any other new, newer therapy solutions. You're looking for exoskeletons, you're looking for virtual rehabilitation, you look for tele-rehabilitation uh, or, or a gaming, uh, gaming aspects. There are a lot of work being done in the gaming aspects. Um, and to see whether that we can, can we use that, that development of science elsewhere, can we use that to improve the patient's outcome in, uh, in after the brain injury and including stroke too. Um, I think I will leave and happy to accept the questions now, if it's okay. Um, Brilliant, thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Babacat. Um, that was really, really interesting to hear about all the work you're doing um, around rehabilitation. Um, we'll come back to a live Q&A at the end. Um, so our next um, guests are actually clients of Erwin Mitchell's, both um, Samiza Mumtaz and um, Mohammed Mumtaz. Um, and we're going to see a short video before we introduce them. Um, so just before we uh, talk to Salmiza about her rehabilitation, I'll just give a brief uh, background as to how Salmiza um, suffered her stroke. Um, so in August 2014, Salmiza had just got married um, to Mohammed um, and she had started to experience um, slurred speech, um, a numb right arm and a headache and she went to um, hospital. Um, a CT scan was performed, um, but she was discharged as uh, she was told that she'd only had a migraine with aura. Um, Samiza then obviously went um, to continue uh, celebrating her wedding festivities with her in-laws. 
Um, she again presented a few days later um, to the hospital um, with the same uh, symptoms, but she had a sudden onset of left-sided headache, expressive dysphagia, uh, right-sided weakness. Um, initially, the admitting doctor had thought she had crescendo TIAs, but it was again decided um, that she, uh, the working diagnosis was that she had a migraine and was discharged home. Um, she had a further attendance at the hospital a further few days on. Um, on this account, um, she again was discharged um, with follow-up um, later on to have a scan. Um, sadly, um, the following day, um, Salmiza suffered a stroke um, and a major stroke and, and, uh, and underwent surgery um, to have a craniotomy. Um, so what I'm going to do is hand over firstly to Salmiza to talk through um, the, uh, the limitations that she suffered immediately after um, suffering the stroke. So, um, hi, um, I'm, I'm Sal. Um, um. I'm Mohamed Sal's husband. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, straight after a stroke, bed bound really, not hardly any, well, no movement at all on the right hand side, um, and literally no sound at all. Um, I think one thing that really sticks in my mind is when we were, the nurse was trying to comb out the matted hair from the craniotomy that was still had blood in it and she wasn't able to vocalise her crying or um, although she visually was in pain she couldn't even get the sound out from, from her crying um, and that kind of remained in that state for a couple of weeks really. Um, she was slowly able to get set up in a chair but still seemed quite slouched so um, yeah. Um, and obviously, um, of course, that's so difficult, and you just obviously just got married as well. And um, what was the psychological impact on both um, you and Salmiza initially when she suffered the stroke? I think it's uh, not something you expect at mm -hmm. such a young age, and especially just if you got married, it was uh, probably the highlight of our life, and suddenly we just um, such, such a traumatic thing happened. But as it was quite difficult to deal with um, but it's probably made us stronger together as a couple anyway um, going through all that together and yeah. Um, and obviously so Samiza was a inpatient um, in hospital for rehabilitation until October but once she was discharged um, what was the re rehab support that um, she received in the community? So Sal stayed, um, she, she carried on having rehab uh, in the community for about another 12 weeks maybe. Um, it was, I think there was like almost like daily Monday to Friday with some sort of therapy assistant coming in to help her uh, do some sort of therapy routine that had been set up by either a physiotherapist or a speech therapist. Um, and she was seen actual therapist maybe like once or twice a week. Um, so that was uh, just for 12 weeks after she was discharged and it, was, it felt just like a trying to set her up to kind of make do at home and carry, be able to carry on somewhat um, with her life. Um, and what would you say um, Salmiza struggled with the most um, after after suffering her stroke? Communicate. Yeah, I, th I think communication was a massive uh, difficulty. Um, I, I think probably the psychological impact of having the stroke and what it did to her and how, how difficult it was to deal with that was probably um, a massive impact on her rehabilitation as well. She she went through phases of being more motivated mm -hmm. and then at times where she literally totally lacked any motivation to partake in um, her rehabilitation. I think there wasn't much, even through 12 weeks, there wasn't any psychological input from a neuropsychologist or anything like that to help her. Uh, deal with what happened. Um, so slowly, she just kind of stopped losing. Or she lost interest in in rehab. Um, and of course, um, in terms of you were um, Hamid um, Salmiza's primary carer initially. Um, and how? What was what was the impact on you? Um, I think it's quite difficult. It's just thrown into something that obviously we didn't expect to happen. Um, I, I think it was initially shock <laughs> but uh, uh, kind of dealing with it I think it was quite sad to not be able to do 
morph somebody you loved. Um, and it was, it was just very difficult not to be able to help her, um, especially when she lacked motivation and was really feeling down. It kind of echoed back and it, 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 was, it was at times very difficult to deal with between the two of us. Um, yeah. um, so of course we've known you um, for quite some time um, and both Guy Forster and I acted for Salmisa in her clinical negligence case. Um, and just by way of a brief background, um, Salmiza's family had um, some concerns around the care that she received. Um, Salmiza's case was litigated um, and four years after she suffered the stroke, um, admissions were made in full that actually earlier intervention um, would have meant that Salmiza um, would have avoided her major stroke and actually all her subsequent um, disabilities. Um, it was at that point we were able to access and um, fund so um, Samiza was able to have um, therapies and start her rehabilitation um, properly really. So um, what was the immediate impact of the rehabilitation once you started having therapists come in? I think um, probably the most evident thing was how keen and eager Sal was. Straight away we had a neuropsychologist come in as well to help her and she was very motivated, very happier. You visually see she was happier and more keen to get involved with the therapy um, and also with the physiotherapist and she's speech therapist. Her speech is, she's not speaking now, I think she's nervous. <laughs> <laughs> she, her speech has come along a lot from uh, back then um, and physically as well with the physiotherapy, like she, her walking has improved a lot, her gait uh, and generally her speed as well. Um, she's. I think one kind of highlight thing was when she um, was independently able to get up off the ground without using the support of any furniture or anybody to help her. So she was able to sit down to the ground and get back up independently. Mm -hmm. And that was really um, it was one of them kind of moments where it's something really visual to see that it's made a massive difference. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of improvement really quickly. Um, so obviously, um Salmiza's case concluded actually the beginning of lockdown last year. How has um, COVID impacted therapies for Salmiza? Um, I think it's been challenging yes. to get um, to carry on with the therapy in a way, but I think it's been the therapist has been quite resourceful. Um, we've carried on some stuff over Zoom and Teams, etc. So we've been uh, still having speech therapy, um, and also the physiotherapist as well was able to do some sort of um, kind of mirror therapy with her, so um, it, it able to kind of demonstrate what uh, or what actions to do and so I was copying her over teams. So that was quite useful um, to, to have a carry on doing something. Um, I think she was struggling with some back pain and things like that. So she was doing some stretches and things with her over, over teams, which was still helping. So it, although it's been challenging and probably not, um, probably not as much out of this year as we could have if we were face to face, but she's still being able to carry on with some sort of therapy, so that's been good. Oh, it's amazing to hear. Um, so obviously um, at, before Salmiza suffered her stroke, um, Salmiza was actually going to start her training course to become a teacher. Um, and we've been catching up obviously when prepping for the webinar series. Salmiza, do you want to tell us, um, um, both Mohammed, what Salmiza is up to now in, by enrolling in college? Um. I'm doing uh, uh, like um... so. Sal wanted to be a teacher, so she yes. wants she's trying to pursue that and carry on trying to um, yes. become a teaching assistant. So her speech therapist um, has tried to help her get into a special needs school. I'm not sure I can say that anymore, actually, uh, <laughs> but. Um, She's unfortunately with the COVID that didn't go ahead, but she's enrolled in college and a course um, for teaching assistant for special needs or stu students with autism. Um, so and, she, yeah, she's doing uh, that at the moment. Uh, I uh, university. I uh, teach. Uh, um, she's also involved with yeah. a university um, on a speech language therapy course. So she's spending time with the students uh, on the course and talking to them, having sessions where they, they call her on teams and they have a session where they talk to her and talk about our experiences as a patient. Mm -hmm. um, 
so that ben benefits them as well as her to have some communication yeah Brilliant, it's absolutely amazing to hear because I know how passionate Samiza was um, about becoming a teacher, so it's really brilliant to see her pursuing that. Um, another little project Samiza has started, um, and Samiza is actually blogging her stroke uh, recovery journey. Um, so, do you want to talk us about what you're up to at the moment? Um, <laughs> so, Sal started a, a blog about her life um, yes. after a stroke, so uh, it's still me that's life. Yes. Dot, um, dot. Code UK. Yes. Um, so it's, it's just following her rehab and her therapy and what she's up to and also just general her lifestyle. Um, but yeah, it's, it's given us something to do and to focus on and also to kind of to uh, document her therapy and her rehab and how she's getting better. Um, um, candle. And she started a um, craft project uh, called Hope by Sal uh, to start making candles, handmade candles by a stroke survivor. Oh, it's amazing. It's brilliant. Um, so just before we uh, wrap up today, would you like to have a message for anyone that's watching today? Um, don't give up um, uh, life is hard but want to uh, conquer yeah conquer um, uh, um, uh, also um, um, driving um, so uh, don't give up yeah slow yeah. slow gains but keep keep going so yeah. if any stroke survivors listening i think it's uh important to you have down days but overall try to stay positive and take every day as it comes mm. um and i think that's probably the best advice you give to anyone brilliant thank you so much to both of you for joining us today um and before we wrap up the session we have a couple of questions um and uh, we've got one for you um it we've got um you spoke about the early stages and the physiotherapist role in preventing secondary complications is it ever too late um, or is there an optimal time i think this is a it's a really interesting question this um i find now i'm working in um uh, further down the line in rehab that the NHS tends to tell clients that they've <coughs> reached their potential at the point of the end of their rehab pathway in the NHS and I would really like to say to everybody and, and help them hear this that people's progression just keeps going on and on and on and you should you shouldn't always remember how plastic the brain is and how adaptive the body can be and that goals just continue to to be achievable for forever really and i think um i think we've we've got to make sure that we keep allowing patients to know that they've got hope for recovery um and that there's always get small gains to be made towards a, bit, a bigger gain so to answer that question there i don't think there is an ultimate time i, I and i'm sure dr babacat would will agree that there is a certain amount of time when medically the brain will will heal itself and and will recover and there'll be a certain amount of certain uh, of, of natural recovery then but the human brain and the human body is so adaptable and so so able to 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 improve and recover that that I think there's always chance for for improvement all for throughout your lifetime and there's there's patients that I treat now that are 25 years post stroke and they're still making changes it may be you're not getting changes to that area where the stroke damaged the brain but the body is so adaptable and I still we don't really fully understand how the brain adapts itself or, and how how much opportunity the brain has to recover. So I think you've got to always have hope and I don't think that we should be giving people um, 
suggestions that they've reached their potential ever. So I don't think there is an optimum time. I, I'm sure there is written in the in the in the medical uh, uh, textbooks that there will be an optimal time where, that, that people will will say. But but I think that, you know, I think everybody's progression is different and it's about the psychology, it's about the environment and it's just about so many factors. And I think there are so many different ways we can enhance recovery. So that I don't think there is an optimum time myself. How would you how would you say that, Dr. Babacat? How would you? Am I can't be any better than what you explained already? You've done fantastic. And whoever asked that question, I think the question was an absolutely superb question. And how will I say that? I'm obviously I'm a clinician and I'm also a manager in an NHS setting. OK, and I, and I hear this word of plateauing and other things on a very regular basis. So how would I? Can you hear me OK? Go yeah, 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 we can hear you. Yeah. How would I put it uh, there? I would. I, I, just like Emma said, recovery never stops. Our brain continues to uh, continues to adapt and change on a, on a regular basis. How I was 10 years ago is I'm not I'm moved on to now. And so is everybody else, including people unfortunately had a stroke and had a disability. But the gains, the amount of gains makes can be different. So the goal setting wise, what goals that the realistic goals you want to achieve in acute sector is different than what you want to gain at 20 years down the line. Doesn't stop you to plan for rehabilitation. So when I see patients in an inpatient setting, I would talk in a different setting and I would say that, okay, maybe NHS provision is not there. Being accept and honest and say that this is what his NHS provision is. Doesn't mean that your recovery stops. You stop thinking of that way. You stop, start, continue to work towards this type of improvement. So the goals changes, your plan of gaining is different. The way you want to gain is different and how you adapt to the new world, the changing world is different, but the change is always going to be there. And if you don't keep that positive note, unfortunately change is going to be in a negative way, which is not going to be helpful to them. Brilliant. Thank you so much to both. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Jenna now to wrap up the session. Hi everyone. Just to confirm that the recording from today's session will be circulated um, once we've finished. Um, and I just wanted to say a massive thank you to our guest speakers. We really have learned um, a great deal from your experiences in relation to stroke rehabilitation, um, which will hopefully help us in our roles going forward. So thank you. I'd also like to thank everyone who has helped to pull this series together, um, which has been a bit of a mammoth task at times, um, but I hope you all agree that it's been worth it. Finally, thank you to everyone that has joined us this afternoon. We hope that you found the session, session useful. And if you've got any further questions, please do not hesitate to get in contact with us. As I said at the start of web, the webinar today, there are two further sessions um, Let's uh, in the uh, let's talk about stroke mini series, and we really hope that you can join us for those too. Please also feel free to go to erwinmitchell.com for all legal updates and information regarding future webinars. And if you can spare two minutes to provide us with your feedback on the session today, it'd be most appreciated. Thanks again, everyone. Good afternoon, and enjoy the rest of your day.